Okay, hello everyone. Uh, this is October 4th, 8 p.m. UTC. I welcome you to session 11. It's a peer-reviewed papers on the theme of open and fair bibliographic metadata. And it will be followed by session 12, the flash talks of poster presentations at 9 p.m. UTC. I am Marie-Claude Coty from Library and Archives Canada, and I'm your moderator for session 11. My DCMI colleague, Alasdair McDonald, will moderate session 12. Uh, before I continue, I'd like to recognize that I am talking to you today from the traditional unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation in Canada. Okay, I'm going to introduce the speakers in a minute. Let me go over some of the session logistics. Each speaker will present um, for, for, for the time they need to, to present, we have plenty of time, one after the other. And at the end uh, the, of, the, of our session, the question prayer will take place. Uh, if you have questions, please use the chat function uh, and I will re read the questions on your behalf. Or you can also raise your virtual hand uh, in the Zoom function and uh, you'll be unmuted to ask uh, the question. For all the details concerning our speakers and their presentations, please visit the conference website at www.dublincore.org. Okay, now, time to introduce the speakers. First, we have Karen Coy of KCOLNET, um, a website, KCOLNET, and uh, Karen will present a proposal for the creation of a version of the Ferber objects work, expression, manifestation, and items, also known as the acronym WIMI. Uh, right after, Brian Dobr Dobreski from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville will share about an investigation of the application of FAIR principles to bibliographic data encoded and marked. Okay, without further ado, please welcome Karen Coy. Karen, I give you the screen. Yes, thank you. That's exactly what I need. Let me share my screen. Oh, I'm clicking and it's not. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Sometimes you click and it doesn't click, you know. So uh, <laughs> yes, what I what I wrote about and what I want to talk to you today is an idea to create um, open versions of work expression manifestation and item. Um, just to give a, a brief introduction to what those are, at least in my mind, uh, is <clears throat> that they came from the Ferber, the functional requirements for bibliographic records in the 1990s. And the work is, an, is described as an abstract notion. It's intellectual, it isn't physical. The expression is how that is expressed in signs. The manifestation is, is how it comes out physically or in some perceptible way, which could also be digital. And then item is an instance of whatever this thing is. It's a single instance. To give you an idea of how this worked in a library environment. So this was developed for library catalog data and only for library catalog data. And it could look something like this, which is that you have the work, which would be Moby Dick, has an author. You have the expression, it's in a language, English or translated to French. It's been manifested in the sense that it's been printed by various publishers and, and in certain dates. And there, there could be much more information here, you know, pages and all of that. And then the library would have, you know, copy one or copy seven or however many copies they have. How the different elements of work expression manifestation and item are um, defined in a way depends on a context. And different people have uh, explored these with different contexts. So the work, is sometimes called the idea, but it also is the subject matter. Expression is the science. It could be even things like musical notation. Manifestation is usually some kind of physicalness, but it can take a lot of different forms. 
And um, there, I've seen that the instantiation actually um, ends up being referred to as the location. It's the thing that can be located. WEMI was developed as both a structure and relationship for library catalogs. Not only was it developed for them, it developed out of them. WEMI was uh, everything that you, that was in Ferber actually was distilled out of existing library catalog practice. So there's nothing really new here except the point of view of seeing the bibliographic data as being in this um, from the most general to the most specific. Because all metadata is technology, it's important to look at the technology that uh, went into um, WEMI. It was first developed, as I said, in, in this functional requirements for bibliographic records that was in the early into mid 1990s. And it has later been um, developed as um, in the, the library reference model, which was sort of er, early to mid 2000s. And so in both of these instances, the technology has an effect on how these things work and, and how they play as metadata and with other metadata. So um, to give an example, oh, why isn't this, I'm not going ahead, there we go. <laughs> something with how Zoom is interacting with me, which is usually very badly. Um, <laughs> so Ferber was based really with the idea of relational database design. And if you think about relational database design, it, it separates your data into separate boxes, each of which has relationships with other boxes. The boxes include the data elements and there are there's no inter there's no overlap you can't have data elements in more than one box object oriented design does something quite similar although it's later and it has more to do with programming than with storage in a database but it also breaks up your data into these boxes these objects that have the data elements in them and it, in this case, it also has some programming information. So the general principles of the library model, both if you look at it in terms of uh, Ferber or if you look in terms of the library reference map, uh, model is that the, the entities in WEMI, this work expression manifestation and item do not overlap. They're quite distinct from each other. They connect, but they're distinct. The relationships between them are fixed and each um, data element that you would define is valid only for one entity. So it's a very precise model for library catalogs. As a matter of fact, you might even say that this is a, an application profile for library catalogs. And you can see how, for example, in the LRM, which has three different places where it wants to uh, in its metadata where it wants to talk about language, those become three different data elements because they are referring to three different um, entities. So there's, uh, of course, like everything else, there's always an upside and a downside. Um, the upside of this, <clears throat> this library data model is uh, one that it's very precise and libraries always like their data to be precise. And we, we know it doesn't quite get there, but it, it's a goal. Uh, it's complete. There's, there's nothing that you wanna say that isn't included in this model. And, um, and it gives you a lot of control over both data creation and data validation. So that's the positive. What I see of as, as being the negative is that one, it's not very flexible. And of course it doesn't intend to be. So these are negatives that I see from uh, points of view, essentially outside of the, the library application mo uh, profile. It requires completeness. If, if you're going to create something and you have a, uh, a work 
and you have a manifestation, you also have to have an expression. So this is, is required to be complete. It isn't very easily extended except within itself. Um, in other words, by the same people who created it. Uh, and all, both of these are IFLA standards. Doesn't it, it play very well with others? Uh, it, it only exchanges well with others using the same structure, uh, which means that you have to do a lot of translation in order to exchange data. Something that I see as a downside is that WEMI defines a structure. Um, and I think that if you are at all familiar with BibFrame, you understand how having different structures can make your metadata um, not so much different, but it can give you different senses of what it is you're describing. And it was designed for a single application, which is the, a, a library catalog, which means that it isn't very useful outside of the library world. But the interesting thing and what got me on this is that there are people outside of libraries who have discovered WEMI and they've found it useful and they've used it. Um, they have, of course, interpreted it in their own way. But it, to me, it, it gives us a very fascinating look at what, what I think in a way libraries develop in, inter, intermittently, no, that isn't the right word. Um, Anyway, <laughs> libraries develop without meaning to, there you go. Um, there's, there's some kernel of truth in WEMI that I think that other people have gotten, have discovered. So I wanted to give you some examples of some of these non-library and non-traditional uses of WEMI. And just to give you an idea, what I, what I see is the idea for uh, Open WEMI is very, very simple, but it takes a little while to get your head around why you might want it. So hopefully this will help you. The first one that I want to talk about is um, this Fabio, which is a Ferber aligned bibliographic ontology. So it is bibliographic. It's part of the CETO vocabulary, which is designed for citation indexing. And so its, its realm is that of academic publication. What they did was they, they looked at Ferber work and they said, OK, Ferber work is this very broad, it's an intellectual or artistic content, da, 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 da. And what we want is something more specific than that for our use. So we create Fabio work. And Fabio work is also intellectual and artistic content, but it's limited to the things that they want to describe with the Fabio metadata. And then in addition to that, you can continue to subclass. One of the wonderful things about subclassing is that it can never end. You continue to subclass so that you can have types of works. Essay is a type of work, uh, is a type of Fabio work. Fabio report is a type of Fabio work, et cetera. And what I always remember, I always forget to say here, and I did this so I would remember is that they did the same thing with expression, manifestation, and items. So for all four, WEMI, they, they subclass to it, but with their own definitions, that fall within the concepts of, of the uh, WEMI entities. In order to make it work, and because it, it was in an environment that wasn't as strict as the library catalog environment, in order to make it work, they added additional relationships between the entities. And you can see them here. And what this means is that you can have a work that relates directly to a manifestation. I can't tell you why you might want to do that, but it, you, it could be because you are creating your data and at the moment you don't have expression information. So it creates greater flexibility by having other um, relationships that, uh, that link between the entities. 
A similar example that's also bibliographic is the music ontology, and it did a, a very similar thing, which is there is now, they created a musical work that is a subclass of Ferber work and et cetera for the other um, entities. I think you can see how this might help us out with all of the, um, if you've looked at the entire uh, and Mark relate Mark list of all the different musical genre. This <laughs> you can see how how this might be used. Moving uh, uh, away from just the bibliographic um, examples, this one I find very interesting. It is um, the other two were using RDF. This uses XML and. They, so they've you know, redefined their own uses of work, expression, manifestation, and item. And what this um, <clears throat> vocabulary is for it is it's for keeping track of the workflow for a legal or legislative document that goes through a lot of revisions. It goes in and out of committees. It goes on and on. It may take years. And at the end, you've got a final product. What I find interesting about this for those of us who've worked in libraries is in libraries, we're always dealing with something that's done. You know, you've got a book, you've got a piece of music, you've got a digital file. This is using Ferber for a workflow. And I, I think that's a, a fascinating way of looking at that you've got your work and it has these different expressions and manifestations as the thing goes through editing. <clears throat> this one I, I can't give you a whole lot about <laughs> because it's over my head, but this was an, an article, a journal article. I don't think this was actually um, finalized, but from someone who works with data sets and the idea was that they would, there are algorithms that can help you understand the relationship between different data elements, whether they've been derived from each other, whether they're just transformations of each other, et cetera. And the person <clears throat> um, looking at this, calling it functional requirements of information resources, saw that you could use work expression manifestation, and then each of the, the boxes here would be items as a way of organizing these. And it has aspects of it that we probably would never use in libraries, which is manifestations that are manifestations of other manifestations and including a work manifestation that is a manifestation of another, of a, a different work manifestation. So it just helps you see um, all of the different kinds of relationships. One of my favorites here is that someone went and looked at Ranganathan's colon classification and the book numbers. So if you haven't discovered Ranganathan, Ranganathan was a librarian from the 1930s, did a lot of theoretical, really interesting theoretical work and developed a classification that was wonderful and so difficult that nobody uses it. But the, the it, Interesting thing is that the book numbers, in other words, what would go onto the back of the book in the library, very neatly follow WEMI. You have the classification number, that's the work, that's followed by either the language or the form, that's expression. Then you get into the publication information, that's the manifestation, and then you get down to the copy number and that's the item. And I. What is beautiful about this is that it very much predates Ferber. As I said, Ranganathan was doing this work in the 1930s, again, which, which tells me that there's some universals here that, um, that we can make use of. The one that is, is the sort of the strangest, well, maybe it isn't the strangest, but it is strange. It was that um, an ontology was developed for the fast fashion industry, uh, a single company. And in that one, uh, they made use of these 
four levels from the most abstract to the most concrete, gave them in completely different names and, and concepts, but it still works in a, in a really amazing way. So the, the work is the style. Some, a designer has come up with a new style. <clears throat> the expression is the, the sort of the production plan, like what fabric is it gonna be? What are the, you know, what's gonna, um, what colors are you going to use? You know, what is going to go into it? What makes it what it is? The manifestation is it as it is manufactured. And that's called a, a stock keeping unit. And then of course, each, I, each piece is an item. So these are uh, some of my, my favorite examples. And what's, what happens when you look at these, or when I looked at these, I thought, don't they have something in common? I mean, they have in common that they're using WEMI. Um, <clears throat> but in many cases, they're using WEMI in a way that would violate the actual library profile definition of WEMI. And the question is, is can we simplify this? Well, you know, Dublin Core is just the right place to do that because those who weren't around for early, early, early Dublin Core may not know that it was created out of the library uh, environment uh, as kind of an extrapolation of, you know, the, the 15 simplest things that you need in order to uh, describe something. So we've, we have before already simplified from something very complex and very tight to a core. So let's see if we can free WEMI uh, for a lot of different uses that aren't limited to the particular library profile. And I think that we can do that by having the basic concepts <clears throat> which we're going to need to come up with some good definitions for, uh, but we, but I think that we understand essentially what they what they are. They will go from general to specific. There will be a direction because I think there conceptually there has to be a direction. We can define a few very key relationships and. Uh, the ones that I'm thinking of kind of steal from the Fabio relationships because I think that those made a lot of sense. I think we should define them as RDF classes. And the reason why I think we should define them as RDF classes is that to make them semantic, but without requiring them to be structures that in the object oriented and in the relational database, idea. And then if you look at, at library data, you, you see that, that things end up being put into structures. And I think that things will end up being put into structures using these, but that these themselves, these four concepts should not define a structure. The proposal is so simple. This is it. I, <laughs> that's all it takes, which is four classes and three relationships that always go from the um, most general to the more specific. One of the things I always get asked is, um, well, how do you think these are gonna be used? They're awfully general. And I do think that they are likely to be used in the same way that Fabio uses them, which is a way to extract, to <clears throat> define your, specific data in relation to more general uh, data concepts. Um, I know that this is hard for people to, to think about in many ways, but if you look at, for example, owl, owl has owl thing. Most of the time people talk about things that more specifically than owl thing, but owl thing is there as an anchor. And the same thing, for example, in schema.org. Schema.org has thing. Uh, rarely would you use thing directly. But you, what you can say is that creative work is a thing and movie is a kind of creative work. And this is where the, the class and the concept idea 
I think helps us out. I do feel strongly about not defining these as structures. Uh, everyone sees their, their metadata in a different way. And RDF does allow you to assert class membership without having to create a structure that is that class and only that class. And the other thing is that there's nothing in the library world, everything gets, gets fit into these, uh, these entities, but, and, and when they're structural, then you tend to do that. But I also think that it should be quite possible that you don't have to have everything in your metadata uh, but in a class of one of these entities. So again, the idea of being as flexible as possible. There are a couple of questions that we have um, or that I have, and, and um, I, I'll show you soon where these have been um, registered. But um, one question is whether we need a super class that um, binds the WEMI together as a unit. This was true in a version of Ferber that was done in the early 2000s. Um, it's not official, it's not an IFLA version. Do we wanna use the terms work, expression, manifestation, and item? Uh, are those gonna be easily understood by other people? Those of us in the library world have been living this like forever and it makes perfect sense to us, but um, <clears throat> you know, we don't, we really need to find out how this, how this sounds to uh, folks encountering it for the first time. And then when, where do these, should these classes live on the web? How can we make them available so that people can use them? So Open WEMI is a Dublin Core working group. It's, it's a community group. Um, the work is being done on GitHub. So github.com DCMI Open WEMI. Uh, if you go to that main page, you'll find out how to sign up for the mailing list. The mailing list um, is very low traffic, so don't worry about that. And then I wanted to give you a link that helps you uh, get to <clears throat> the, as I said, there's, I, I have a, this is a link to links <laughs> that I created a bibli bibliography of all the sources that that I'm finding that relate to this um, expansion of WEMI into something more open. And I've also begun an FAQ for some of the questions that always uh, seem to pop up, but I'm dying to hear what other questions you, uh, you have. Okay, so that's, that's it for me. And I will stop screen sharing as long as everyone's gotten those things written down, but I'm sure we can get them to you in the, um, you know, in the, in the conference notes as well. Yes. Wow, thank you very much, Karen. It's, uh, um, it's fascinating work. <laughs> uh, I have, as a librarian, I've never considered that we could be used outside of libraries, like the fashion industry and... Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's an eye opener. <laughs> yes, it is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's what intrigued me, I have to say. Well, it does intrigue me now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again, Karen. And Brian, mm -hmm. this is now your uh, your turn to present us with your, pre um, your presentation. Let me again check the title. Do I have the title? Yes, I have the title. How fair is Mark Fair Data Principles and Bibliographic Data? So Brian, you have the floor. All right, uh, so I think that it is uh, screen sharing. Is that correct, Marie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. perfect. Great. All right, thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm Brian Dabreski from University of Tennessee, uh, Knoxville, and today I'm presenting on behalf of my co-authors, uh, Heather Malazan Sandy at the University of Missouri, and Bradley Wade Bishop, also at University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And this is really a uh, just a short conceptual paper that examined the relationship between the FAIR principles and the MARC bibliographic standard, or what we ended up calling how, how FAIR is MARC. 
Uh, so in all domains, data sharing enables discovery, use, reuse, right? It's a good thing, but um, doing so effectively often requires some deliberate action and planning. And there is a, a distinction uh, between open data uh, and open data that is fully actionable. In the cultural heritage domain, bibliographic records uh, representing information resources in the collections of libraries and other institutions constitute a very large and growing source of data. So how open and furthermore, how actionable is such data uh, compared to data sets from other domains, for example? So we decided to um, investigate this at a very broad level by attempting to understand how the MARC standard itself or uh, not afford characteristics laid out by the FAIR data principles. So I know uh, a lot of folks are probably familiar with these, but I'll just uh, give a brief uh, overview of the FAIR data principles. Uh, in 2016, they were uh, first published about, created as guidelines to describe um, uh, aspirational attributes, I guess, <laughs> of data that should be able to uh, uh, address, uh, um, uh, to be open and to be machine actionable. And so FAIR lays out 15 principles within a framework of these four major, uh, 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 you know, top level principles here, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Now, FAIR has been very um, influential. It's been adopted or utilized in some way across a lot of organizations, uh, disciplines, and domains used in a lot of uh, research and literature as well. Um, sorry, I have a cat uh, interrupting me. <laughs> Apologies about that. <laughs> We needed a cat to interrupt someone. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's not Zoom unless an animal appears un, uh, unexpectedly. So um, fair data principles are important because uh, uh, open data, uh, of course, is data that can be freely used or shared or built on by anyone. But the fair data principles provide a set of best practices for sharing data in ways that can also respect any of the logical, uh, ethical, legal, or contractual uh, restrictions on the data set. Uh, well, bibliographic data may not be um, what the proponents of FAIR data were thinking of immediately when they uh, created that. Uh, FAIR is meant to extend uh, across domains and across the, also the data metadata divide, because what is metadata in one setting uh, may be data in another setting. In libraries and other cultural heritage institutions, there are large data sets of bibliographic metadata uh, which is data that represents information resources in collections. Uh, much of this data has been encoded in uh, the MARC format, uh, seen here in uh, raw form, uh, but then also here in an interface more akin to what a library cataloger might see when working with this data. Now, MARC was originally developed in uh, the 1960s uh, to facilitate the conversion of card catalogs into electronic databases. So it was designed at a time when machine actionable really just meant machine readable. Uh, that was really the action uh, that people were planning for. Uh, 60 years later, MARC uh, remains the de facto standard for encoding bibliographic descriptions. Uh, though the standard itself, uh, along with all the software and applications that use it, have gone through uh, many updates over the years. Uh, even so, Mark has faced uh, continued criticism for lack of uh, extensibility and lack of interoperability. So to begin to investigate um, the FAIR data principles in relation to bibliographic data, we decided to start at the standard level and think about what affordances MARC has for FAIR data. In other words, how FAIR is MARC? So using the standard itself as the unit of analysis rather than any specific records or data sets, uh, the authors compared the FAIR framework to the official documentation for the MARC standard available from uh, Library of Congress's websites. Uh, looking for correlates between FAIR requirements and affordances in MARC. Uh, through review of the documentation, discussion, and numerous arguments, uh, the authors sought to consider the best case scenarios uh, in terms of possibilities for FAIR bibliographic data that the MARC standard permits. 
So I'm going to walk through our findings, uh, kind of one fair principle at a time. Uh, first, the findable principles here, which cover um, the identification and indexing of data. Uh, so here, Mark can, of course, accommodate rich metadata and refers to entities that are of interest uh, to the community with a number of different uh, uh, standard identifiers. Uh, however, Mark does not uh, prescribe a globally unique persistent identifier for uh, individual records. A registration of the records themselves um, in indexing sources uh, varies, though MARC records can be easily indexed in uh, bibliographic utilities, especially uh, WorldCat, which is perhaps the most well-known. The accessible principles deal with uh, persistence and permission. Here, uh, MARC records uh, can be retrieved using open protocols like Z3950, although uh, doing so often requires some specialized software. Uh, MARC retrieval through these methods can be configured to require authentication, so it does fulfill that principle. The second, uh, A2, what's listed A2 here, was a difficult principle um, to consider uh, here. Uh, FAIR is telling us that metadata should remain accessible even when the data itself is no longer. And MARC data is in itself metadata, and in most cases, institutions do not save MARC records once an item has been deaccessioned. So they don't keep MARC records for uh, data for information resources uh, that are no longer present in their collections. Uh, interoperability, of course, a key metadata principle and one of the FAIR data principles as well. Uh, difficulty with interoperability has been one of the main criticisms of MARC over the years. Now, MARC is widely used in libraries and there is a massive amount of MARC data, but um, it's not a format that is used often outside of libraries or other cultural heritage institutions. Uh, we had quite a bit of debate uh, around the second interoperability principle here uh, about the use of other FAIR vocabularies. So Mark does not really stipulate the use of any particular vocabularies. There's often choices in any given element. Uh, and in fact, Mark can accommodate data from FAIR vocabularies. The most common value vocabularies that are used in MARC uh, are not entirely fair, though. Things like Dewey Decimal Classification, uh, Library of Congress, uh, subject headings and Library of Congress classification are technically not freely accessible to have access to the full schedules and tables. It's often subscription based. Now, again, MARC doesn't require you to use those vocabularies, uh, but they are the most common ones that you'll find in MARC records. Uh, there's been a much greater emphasis in recent years on including uh, or recording URIs in various MARC fields for things. Uh, this may not have been standard practice for most of MARC's history, but it does, uh, MARC does indeed support the recording of URIs. Uh, and reusability, our, our final FAIR principle here, focuses on uh, data reusability and what is needed to support that. So being highly optimized for its domain, Mark certainly affords the recording of uh, attributes that are relevant to this domain. Uh, as far as data uh, licensing information goes, the inclusion of data usage license information, uh, again, might not be common practice, but it is possible in Mark. The 038 field does allow for the recording of this information. Uh, similarly, uh, the MARC 040 field requires or records some of the information uh, associated with provenance. So um, it usually allows you to determine where a record was created and who is edited and so on. And this is actually a, a quite common field to find in records. Uh, and finally, as a community developed and maintained standard, MARC can certainly be seen as meeting domain relevant community standards, right? It is uh, used in the community that it has been designed for uh, over many years. So overall, we were uh, somewhat surprised by how much the current MARC standard is actually able to allow for fair data practices. Uh, MARC and practices surrounding MARC do enable each of the FAIR principles to some extent, but did not adhere fully to any one of them. 
Uh, as in many discussions of Mark, uh, we can see that some of its strengths are also uh, weaknesses here. In this case, uh, Mark has very wide um, community support and it's very well adapted to the materials that it describes. Uh, but this focus on uh, the bibliographic community has left MARC data less accessible to the outside world, uh, and MARC as a standard has not kept pace with data practices in other domains. Uh, for example, things like greater leveraging of URIs, uh, open vocabularies. Uh, as you could probably tell from our, our findings as well, it's very hard to disentangle a standard from actual practice. So some affordances are present in the standard, even if not in common usage. Uh, for example, the 038 field allowing you to record data license information. It's not a field that you will often find used, but it is possible, right? Uh, so it's in the standard, but perhaps not in practice. Uh, same thing with the FAIR, uh, other FAIR vocabularies. It's in practice, but not in the standard. And so kind of disentangling that is very difficult to do. Uh, it's also difficult to disentangle MARC from, uh, from AACR2, uh, and RDA, uh, which are the domain-specific content standards, which have dictated what data can be included and how it is included for many MARC users. And in case you're interested, this is a picture from my own personal collection. Uh, this was the very end of retrospective conversion uh, at the Sibley Music Library, um, almost like, I don't know, like 25 years after it started, maybe we were finally uh, uh, <laughs> at the end of that there. So that was summer of 2000. Uh, and 10, I think, uh, the very uh, end of converting the cards into electronic MARC records. So some other takeaways from our examination, uh, the FAIR data principles are intended to apply both uh, to data and metadata, though in the bibliographic domain, the data itself is metadata, and so keeping the resource versus data uh, versus um, uh, you know, meta metadata, even uh, keeping that all separate can be more difficult in this domain, perhaps than elsewhere. And so that certainly adds some complications when attempting to use FAIR as an assessment metric in the bibliographic domain. Another interesting discussion uh, that came up has to do with machine actionable, which FAIR is meant to support. So what does it mean uh, for bibliographic data to be machine actionable? Uh, originally, we know that this just meant that it could be read <laughs> by a machine, uh, though catalogs certainly offer many more functions now. Um, what other actions could and should be supported by bibliographic data, though, uh, particularly outside of the confines of your typical library catalog? Uh, and bibliographic data is indeed uh, circulating outside of catalogs. Uh, uh, it has for some time, but uh, there's a much greater prospect for this coming up. Uh, Library of Congress is now more actively working on publishing BibFrame uh, data sets of bibliographic data. And so here we are seeing uh, very large bibliographic data sets, not in MARC, but in BibFrame. Uh, uh, and their uh, uh, you know, plans to, uh, throughout the rest of the year, uh, continue publishing uh, uh, bibliographic records as BibFrame data sets. Um, uh, is something that we see. So in a world uh, beyond catalogs and beyond marks, what will this mean uh, for bibliographic data to be fair then? So while this study was intended to offer an initial uh, conceptual investigation into how fair data principles could or should be applied uh, to bibliographic data, it uh, itself was perhaps unfair <laughs> in some ways. Uh, MARC is a standard, right? Uh, but data sets represent standards in practice. Uh, local usage and implementation are going to vary uh, from institution to institution. So to take a closer, more functional look at fairness of MARC data, uh, a deeper investigation of some specific data sets would actually be the next step here. Uh, at the same time, uh, taking a look at the affordances of another emerging standard here, BibFrame, uh, could be useful to see how BibFrame could stand to increase fairness of bibliographic data. Uh, taking a closer functional look here is going to likely uh, require us to wait a little bit longer uh, for BibFrame data sets to actually be created and available, though, again, that's something that appears to be uh, coming from Library of Congress in the coming months. 
So as it stands, the MARC data has the potential to be fairer, uh, perhaps, than the authors considered, but uh, there are still opportunities to increase fairness. And this is certainly something that we should care about in cultural heritage institutions, as we hope to uh, share our data sets and see them used and reused more widely. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Brian. Um, that's very interesting to see how Karen took a, a library concept or practice for lack of a better word and uh, apply it to um, to domain outside of the library while well, you took um, a concept originally developed for scientific research data and brought it into uh, the library realm that that's that that's very interesting to see how uh, libraries are great but we, <laughs> <laughs> we can connect to everything right <laughs> yes exactly where we, we should run the world <laughs> um, but to see it, both presentations has, um, have made me realize how uh, bibliographic description, how libraries are rich in data that we don't uh, exploit. Uh, we should use, uh, we could do so much more with library data. So thank you for this presentation and thank you for the cat because that's the first cut of the conference for me, so I can uh, check this oh, okay. one on my yes. bingo card. <laughs> well, we got that one in. <laughs> okay, so we'll, uh, we'll have session 12, poster presentations, moderated by my DCMI colleague, Alaza McDonald. So just short break, don't leave, and uh, we'll be back in, uh, in a few minutes. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to our speakers, and I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you.